Step 6. Design resistance of shear connector. The design resistance of a single-headed shear connector in a solid concrete slab should be determined as the smaller of equation 6.18 or equation 6.19, in which alpha value is taken as 1.0 for the height of shear connector over its diameter is larger than 4. Insert the alpha value in equation 6.18 yield the design resistance of single-headed shear connector as 81.7 kN. Meanwhile, before we can calculate equation 6.19, we first need to determine the elastic modular value ECM. The elastic modular is calculated as highlighted in the red box, which finally give the design resistance of single-headed shear connector from equation 6.19 as 85 kN. Because of PRD calculated from equation 6.18 is less than equation 6.19, Therefore, the design resistance of single-headed shear connector is taken as 81.7 kN. OK students, previously, the resistance design of the shear connector PRD has been calculated. In this step, we need to calculate the degree of the shear connector that will be carried by the shear stud. Therefore, condition highlighted in the red box must be satisfied in which the ratio of the compressive force in the concrete flange, NC, over, the compression force in the concrete flange at full shear connection, NCF, must be larger than 0.4, in which, 0.4 is calculated from this equation. To determine the degree of shear connection present in the beam, first, the axial resistance of the steel and concrete are required. OK. Now, let's determine the value of NCF. As mentioned earlier, NCF is the compression force in the concrete flange at full shear connection, in which can be calculated using stress block diagram. Here, NCF can be calculated by multiplying 0.85 FCD with effective width and height of concrete slab as highlighted in the red box. However, we, first, need to determine the effective width of the compression concrete flange. The effective width of the compression concrete flange, is given in EC3, part 11, clause 5.4.1.25. From the given clause, the effective width of the concrete flange at the midspan is determined from the highlighted equation in the red box. This figure defined the distance of B. I, B, note and B, E, I. If you provide only one shear stud throughout the top flange of the beam, thus, the distance of B note must be taken as 0 mm. Meanwhile, if two numbers of shear connectors being provided throughout the top flange of the beam, thus the length of B note can be taken as 80 mm. On the other hand, BI can be calculated by divide the effective length LE with 8, but this value must not be lesser than BI. OK now, let's calculate our effective width. In our case, the effective length is 9 meter, because it is simply supported. Let's first calculate B. I, that is the distance from the outside shear connector, to a point midway between adjacent webs. To calculate the effective width, I just provide two conditions of degree of shear stud resistance. The first is if we provide only one row of shear stud on top of the flange. And the second condition is, if two rows of shear stud is being provided at the top of the flange. Therefore, based on the formulation and guidance shows in previous slides, for one row of shear stud, B1 is equal to B2, which is 6.75 meter. Meanwhile, if two rows of shear stud being provided, thus, B1 and B2 is equivalent to 1.71 meter. Next, for one row of shear stud, B1 is equal to B2, which is 1.125 meter. Meanwhile, if two rows of shear stud being provided, thus, 
B1 and B2 is equivalent to 1.125 meter. Insert back into the equation, hence at midspan, for one row of shear stud, the effective width of the concrete flange is 2.25 meter. And for two rows of shear stud, the effective width of the concrete flange is 2.33 meter. Once the effective width has been calculated, next, we then now can substitute back into the equation to determine the NCF. The NCF is then being calculated, in which for one row of shear stud, the NCF value is equivalent to 2103.8 knots. Meanwhile, if two rows of shear stud being provided, thus the NCF value is equivalent to 2179 knots. Okay. So far, we have calculated the value of NCF next is to determine the value of NPL, which is, the axial resistance of the steel. The tensile resistance of steel member, NPL, can be calculated as shown in the red box, in which in this case is equivalent to 1831.5 kN. Thus, we have now already calculated both value of NCF and NPL, which are, the axial resistance of the steel and concrete respectively. Just to recall, the concrete force at the full shear connection is the lesser of NCF and NPL. Just to recall, the concrete force at the full shear connection is the lesser of NCF and NPL. Therefore, in this example, the compressive force is equivalent to NPL, which is 1831.5 kN. Now, let's determine the number of shear stud requires, N, and the reduced value of the compressive force in the concrete flange, NC for the proposed beam. The number of shear connector required to the point of maximum bending moment, is equivalent, to, NCF, divided by design connection of the shear connector, PRD therefore, in the case of one row of shear stud being proposed, thus, number of connector presents is equivalent to 22 numbers. Meanwhile, in the case of two rows of shear stud being proposed, thus, the number of connector presents is equivalent to 11 numbers. Finally, the number of reduced compressive force can be calculated. For the case of one row, the reduced compressive force, NC, is calculated to be 1797.47 kN. And in the case of two rows of shear connectors, the reduced compressive force, NC, is calculated to be 898.7 kN. Once the value of the reduced of compressive force, NC, and the concrete compressive force at full shear connection, NCF have been determined. We can now substitute the values into the main equation, highlighted in the red box. Therefore, the degree of shear connection, which are the ratio of the reduced compressive force, NC, to the concrete compressive force at full shear connector, NCF in the case of one row, the degree of shear connection, is determined to be 0.98, which is larger than the required value of 0.4. And in the case of two rows of shear connectors, the degree of shear connection is determined to be 0.49, which is larger than the required value of 0.4. Therefore, we can conclude that the degree of shear connection provided either one row or two rows are satisfied. OK students, now let's continue to the next step, which is, step 6, design resistance of the cross-section at composite stage. As noted, for the construction stage, the top flange is restrained laterally, and therefore, only cross-sectional resistance is need to be verified. Again, as noted for the construction stage, the shear buckling resistance of the web does not need to be verified. The next step is, to verify the plastic resistance of the composite beam to vertical shear. From EC4, Part 11, Clause 6.2.2.21, in which, the resistance to vertical shear. 
VPLRD, should be taken as the resistance of the structural steel section. Therefore, in this case the vertical shear resistance of the section is adequate. Next, is to verify the resistance of the composite beam due to bending. To calculate the bending capacity of the composite beam, first, we need to identify the location of the plastic neutral axis. In this case, the plastic neutral axis lies in the slab, in which 46.2 mm from the top of the top concrete fiber. As you can see in this figure, by taking moment at the plastic neutral axis, the bending capacity of the composite beam can be determined. In this example, the bending capacity of the composite beam is calculated to be 642.3 kN-m. Substituting the value into the equation MED slash MRD we finally can conclude that the design bending resistance of the composite beam is adequate, as the ratio of the MED slash MRD is less than 1. Next, we need to verify the local shear in concrete. We must verify that design shear forces must be lesser than design shear resistance of the composite beam VRD in which VRD is calculated as shown in the red box. For local shear in concrete in surface, OA VRD is calculated as highlighted in the first box, which give us the value of 342 newton per millimeters and the vrd must be lesser or equivalent to the one calculated in the second box for local shear in concrete in surface bb vrd is calculated as highlighted in the third box which give us the value of 473.23 newton per millimeters and the vrd must be lesser or equivalent to the one calculated in the fourth box, which in this case is 1232 newton per millimeters. Finally, the value of VRD is the minimum of the value calculated in first box, second box, third box and the fourth box. In this case, the least value is 342 newton per millimeter. The design longitudinal shear can be calculated, as shown in the red box, in which, give the value of 407 newton per millimeter. From the calculation, we can see that, the design of longitudinal shear resistance, VLED, is not adequate. This is because, the value of VLED, which is 407 newton per millimeter, is larger, than the minimum calculated design local shear resistance, in surface OA and surface BB, which is 342 newton per millimeter. Therefore, it is suggested that the size of mesh is increased to one size bigger, for example a 393. We can see that when the size of a 393 mesh is used, the minimum calculated design shear resistance in surface OA circumflex Euro and BA circumflex Euro B can be increased up to 666 newton per millimeter. The final step is step 7, that is verification of deflection at serviceability limit state. We first calculate the beam deflection due to permanent actions applied to steel beam and we can see that the deflection 26.1 mm. Next, we then, calculate the beam deflection due to permanent actions, applied to composite steel beam. For this condition, we first need to calculate, the second moment of area for the composite section. The second moment of area, for the composite section, can be calculated as highlighted in the red box, in which, the value of second moment of area is given by 767.65 to the power of 6 mm to the power of 4. Finally, the beam deflection due to permanent actions applied to composite beam is 0.92 mm. The last one is the beam deflection due to variable actions applied to composite steel beam.
and we can see that the deflection is determined to be 8.9 mm. Here are the summary of the SLS deflection check. From the table, we can see that the actual deflections are lesser than the allowable deflection, L-200. Therefore, we can conclude that, the deflection at SLS is satisfactory. OK, now let me highlight it some points in the conclusion. Design of composite beam requires the designer to verify the capability of the proposed beam at construction and composite stage. Similar procedure must be applied to design composite steel plate girder or composite steel truss structure. In composite plate girder, only the bottom flange is considered as acting in tension. The top flange and web is ignored. Effective width is determined in a similar manner to that of universal beam composite slab. Axial and moment equilibrium are used to determine the bending capacity. Effective width is determined in a similar manner to that of universal beam composite slab. Axial and moment equilibrium are used to determine the bending capacity, as shown in the figure. Equilibrium forces finally, give neutral axis. X and moment capacity as shown in the red box. Meanwhile for composite truss. The approach to the design of composite truss is similar to that of the composite universal steel beam. In this case, only the bottom flange is considered as acting tension and the top flange is ignored. The effective width calculations are similar to that for the composite universal steel beam. Axial and moment equilibrium for the section is then used to determine its bending capacity. OK class, let's do some exercises to enhance your understanding. This is exercise 2. This exercise is to enhance your understanding in designing composite steel plate girder. OK, good luck.